are all a little section of a stud wall, wood stud wall versus a metal stud wall, and you can see why the, uh, there's a wood stud wall, 16 inch centers, there's an inch and a half of wood, and uh, what, 14 and a half inches of insulation. In the metal stud wall you get, except for the thickness of the stud, you get the full insulation. Right. And so the insulation composite value is better in a metal stud wall than a wood stud wall. I think that was your question. But it, How much of this insulation can be done to an existing building? Well, it depends on the type of construction. If it's if it's like concrete block, uh, one thing that you can do, the same company makes a foam that's made out of the same product, and again, it's not the toxic formaldehyde urethane foams that they had a problem with in the 70s during the energy crisis. But they can go on the inside of the building up high above your ceiling and they can punch holes and they can pump them full, you know, the cavities. Uh, if it's brick construction, uh, you're hurting because you've only got so much gap. I mean, you can go on the outside and put the rigid insulation and then put the stucco, or you can go on the inside. But either one of those, all three of those are very costly. You can go on the inside and put um, uh, metal studs and then insulate and drywall, you know, and provide your insulation and take up about this much of your interior space on the perimeter. And we've done that for basements and existing old buildings, you know, we've done that throughout commercial structures. But you're getting into some pretty costly items versus a low cost, no cost. I mean, there's a lot of things that you'll see after this seminar and when you start, we start doing design and prioritizing, there's a lot of things you can do that far exceed this. I mean, this can save you a lot of energy but it's down the list. You, you need to couple that with major capital improvements, renovation. I mean, there's too many other things that can save you energy that you can get paid back so much faster because, well, for example, Ed looked at some numbers on roofs. I mean, an old Moggy fire station had wood deck, built up roof, no insulation, zero, none. And uh, they had a, a roof leak. I mean, it was raining cats and dogs. Every time it rained, it just run through. And there's some other reasons for that. But, they're so obvious I couldn't believe they couldn't find the leak. But anyway, they were wanting to put a new roof on it. Well, that's the time. If you're going to replace roofs, then take this dollars and invest in insulation. Not the roof, but insulation on energy savings. You've got to put the roof on anyway. Don't you're try talking to... about an insulation between your roof sheathing and your metal sheathing on your, I mean, your roof skin and your metal sheathing. In well, between there, aren't you? Now, he's referring to the walls, aren't you? Well, no, I'm on the roof. I've changed from the wall to the roof. Well, for example, there they had, and that it depends on the application, they had wood joist and plywood deck. And it's real easy to come in and put a rigid insulation right there. And then you can put a nailer, what's called a nailer, above it that you adhere to, and you shoot through both of them. And this is your insulation. And then when you put your built-up roof on it, it adheres to this nailer. It bonds to it. it will, it'll melt the insulation, but it won't melt the nailer. And that's, you know, so there's several different applications, but we recommend that at that time, but even looking at that, to give an example why I got off my story, is the payback was what, Ed? 11 years? 7 years? Oh, I don't remember, Mike. I'm sorry. Okay. It, was, it was something out there like 7 to 11 years, you know, payback. Well, there's things that you can do that Charlie will touch on tomorrow, probably tomorrow, that has a payback of uh, months. You know, and, and so what we will do is show you how to prioritize and go after those things from the fastest payback, the biggest benefit, and all the low cost, no cost maintenance items, and you work your way towards capital improvement items. A payback, you're meaning you're going to save that much energy to pay for the job? Pay for the job, yes. Well, then some of them will be in a matter of like three months. And then it's a large load in the building. It's it's like one third of the building load, or 25, well, it depends, 25% to some buildings, half the building load. But we'd like to say the best for last. Uh, one thing on the, on the ceiling while we're there, on 
if you have, there's a lot of buildings you'll have that are a residential grade type construction, they have attic space, your blow-ins, your cheapest insulation you can put up there. Or, the reason why I say that, if you want to know the cheapest thing you can do, go look at houses. That's why they're on houses, they're the cheapest, that's why people can afford them. But people go, God, the cost of the house is high. Well, yes it is, but compared to commercial structures, it's cheap. So if you want to know what's cheap, go look at what's on a house. And blow-in insulation is what they use for attic insulation, it's because it's the cheapest. Uh, but houses typically, the ones that i built, I, I don't use less than R38. You know, and attics, and I try to use R25 walls. Uh, there's still a lot of people out there with $300,000 homes that have a half that. But in commercial buildings, uh, like I said, the minimum to me is like an R19 roof. Uh, a lot of people get by with less. Uh, the concrete block on the wall, back on the wall second, there's a product I've used that's better insulation than concrete block that's a translucent wall panel. It's called cow wall. I mean, there's products on the market that's a substitute for glass. You, it's like a skylight. They're white. And it lets light through the building, lights the building up, and you can get those in the R7 and clear up to an R19. You know, and I mean, it lets light in your building. It lets your building glow in the dark at nighttime. It looks like a big glow bug. It's pretty neat. Um, windows. Your windows, as we've touched on before, has a tremendous impact on the overall efficiency of the, the structure. Uh, there are several different types, mostly commercial, they're fixed, but you can have sliders, double hung, single hung, awning, or casement windows, and of course there's skylights. The least that you should have on a commercial building is one inch hermetically sealed insulating glass. Uh, one inch is the thickness of the paint itself. There's actually two panes, quarter inch glazing. <coughs> a lot of times we use a quarter inch exterior and a three sixteenth inch paint interior with a divider strip and it makes up a one inch insulated glass. A lot of the structures, a lot of buildings will not have that. They'll be just single hung windows or single pane glass and aluminum frames. Uh, there's some things you can do with that. Those can be converted out. You can have screw in stops and put in insulated glass. There's several things you can do to existing buildings with glazing that correct a lot of those problems. But again, that's getting to more cost, costly items. That's more in capital improvement. It, it needs to be on a phased program. Uh, windows do not have a fast to pay back, but yet they do pay back and they're an important element. It's cheap if you build it. I mean, compared to adding it after the fact. I mean, it's like twice every time. You go back in after the fact, it costs you twice as much. You have to remove the old, you have to deal with the old restraints, you have to have it fitted to match, all those kind of issues. Where if you're building designing from new, it, it just makes sense to, uh, in comparison cost wise. On the windows, there's a chart on 77, just a little description there. It talks about the windows, that, and it's, it's what I've already spoke on, but on the north, minimize the window areas to reduce heat loss, winter storms in Oklahoma. We use small windows for daylighting, ventilation. Shading is not normally needed because it's on the north. Uh, your west, obviously avoid large unshaded glass areas to reduce heat loss and heat gain. During the summer afternoon, gains will be severe problem. If any of you sit in front of windows on the west side of a home or a commercial building with no overhang and it just beats on you, uh, what happens there is if your T-stat is set anywhere close to that, it will try to satisfy that temperature and it'll freeze other people in other parts because they're trying to satisfy that low on the west side. So if you have poor design, coupled with poor design of the building, if you have poor, I wouldn't say poor design, but if you have a design situation where the uh, mechanical engineer is trying to deal with the architectural element that he's been dealt, the cards he's been dealt, so to speak, to keep everybody happy, he has to overcompensate on that western exposure to satisfy those parameters. And unless you can afford a variable error or a multi-zone system, it's a single zone system, whoever's on the interior pays the penalty in overkill because you're trying to satisfy that load that hits you in the afternoon. So it's, it's kind of a snowball, you know, from designing of the envelope and designing of the architectural integrity snowballs into the HVAC design and then your lighting design will snowball into HVAC design and all that snowballs into your actual energy cost. So, you know, everything interfaces and has profound impact on one another and what you get stuck with. 
you know, the east and the south, um, and they're self-explanatory. The east is, is nice morning light, but at the same time, uh, it's not as good as south light in terms of heating in the winter. It's not as harsh on you as the summer in the summer as the west, but uh, your south is your best exposure for heating in the wintertime. The impact I've already pretty well talked on, but this really need to read these. These are all this is very good reading and it's, and it's good information. Uh, one thing I will tell you, there's different. You get what you pay for, and, and we touched on shading coefficients earlier and items like that. And in the uh, appendix, there's a little in, there's a little uh, chart in there on different transmissions coefficients of materials. But one thing I'll tell you is the cheapest glass is the least efficient glass. No different than anything else. You get what you pay for. The cheapest equipment on the market is usually the least efficient. That's why you have rooftops. They're the cheapest. They're the least efficient. Uh, and the cheapest one of the rooftops is the lowest SEER, or the builder's grade, or the bottom line grade. The more uh, efficient it is, the more it costs you. The same way as glass, uh, there's different designs of the glass in terms of the coatings they can put on the glass to reflect heat. And in a commercial building, a lot of times you want, if you're on a western exposure, you want a high reflectance. You, you don't want a high rate of absorption and transmission. You want a coefficient that will turn back the heat off that western exposure. Well, it costs you. So if you want it, you, you end up paying for the glass if you're going to have a lot of exposure in terms of design. Uh, your solar gray, such as this one out here, if I'm not mistaken, Solar gray, solar cool gray. You have solar bronze, and they've done, they come up with these terms to make it sound like it's solar. Sounds kind of nice. Like, hey, it's, well, solar gray, cool, and solar warm gray, and solar bronze are the cheapest glasses on the commercial market. Tinted, they're tinted gray or bronze, and they're not very efficient. Uh, they're the cheapest ones, and they have a very poor reflectance coefficient. Uh, some of your better glasses, and you can talk to any glass representative and they can tell you, oh man, that costs money. Well, it does. But for example, in residential, you can now get windows that have an R10 rating, which is unheard of just a few years ago. I mean, because typically they're what? They had a two, two double panes, usually one R per pane. You're talking the 10 is a triple pane with a heat mirror. Pane. Right. Uh, and, and normally it's very cost prohibitive in a home because yeah, it's expensive. The frame, the frame the work versus the wood. Well, the best is wood. Yes. But the best in terms of maintenance is to have wood core with an aluminum baked on enamel finish on the exterior. So you've got the low maintenance and then the mass of the wood. And have a thermal broke frame. And it's thermally broke so it doesn't transmit through. That's the thing, another thing about aluminum. And you've got a aluminum frame here, and here's your slab, or anywhere on the building. There's your glass pane, and that's shot down to the slab, different attachment systems. Well, this is hollow. And there's nothing there. It's just hollow. Every one of those things are hollow. And that's right. And it's not uncommon you'll see condensate build up around windows. And it's because you get the heat and the moisture of this conditioned space, you get that cold dryer in the winter, and you'll get a little development. And a lot of times, in fact, most of them are designed to have a weep system because you'll get internal condensation build up and it has to have, have a way to weep out because it'll, it'll get so much build up in there. Uh, a thermal broke frame is a design where they come in here because, see, this is exposed to the conditioned space, this is exposed to non conditioned, and it can induct and transmit clear through the frame because it's one monolithic piece. Well, some of the designs they've come in with is a thermal broke frame, and they'll come in here, and at this point, the frame will also <coughs> theoretically look like they're several configurations. They'll break the frame at this point and have it glued together with a, it's a real dense neoprene-like material, but it's real hard and dense, and it'll break that transmission that comes through. Not totally, but it's a tremendous impact difference. Again, that costs more. The cheapest frames on the market is what you typically see. They're just run-of-the-mill framework. Uh, 
So it's important when you when you build on or add on or do any type of renovation, find out from the architect what's the characteristics, what's the properties on the glazing. Just ask them what the properties on the glazing are. You want to know what the coefficients of a reflectance is, its absorption, you know, transmissions. You know, you want to know the characteristics. You want to, or a product literature, a cut sheet, a fact sheet on the glass he's providing for you, and. Uh, you can talk to them, we'll get into that a little bit better on the design of how those numbers, the values, what they mean. Because uh, it will impact, and it doesn't cost that much more when you're building on or you're starting the new construction. Infiltration, next subject, and that's a, a big impact on houses. It's, it's an impact on commercial. Uh, on page 79 in there, it says a typical new building infiltration comprises, of, it's in a range of about 10 to 20 percent of the total heating and cooling. And basically, I'll let Ed and Charlie deal with the technical aspect, but I don't care what your, your building's made out of, you'll get infiltration or transmissions through a wall, winds and, and various elements impact that, but through solid materials wood siding, insulation, drywall. Uh, it's not as prevalent in the concrete block as the mass density, but you do have infiltration anywhere. There's uh, connections in the building. Uh, the one for your, from your block up here, you'll have a, something to set and there'll be a joist if you use steel frame, which is most common. Well, then you have elements here and then you'll have a parapet. <coughs> this winds come up in here and whip and can migrate through. There's all different types of way that air impacts and infiltrates, so I call infiltration, infiltrates, just think of it as a subversive communist plot. It's, it's infiltrating the building, it has ways to get in there, find ways, and it's called infiltration. Uh, one of the biggest things to do to that that is tremendous, and we've started doing this on commercial buildings, what Pete mentioned on a house, is <coughs> your studs and your slabs here, insulation, come in at this point and put visqueen, six mil, four mil, but I like six mil, it's thicker, and you wrap the entire inside before you put up any of your finished material, drywall or otherwise, and you wrap, overlap your seams and duct tape them, wrap them down on the floor, and then when you put your drywall on, you can cut them back. And you go around your, your uh, conduit boxes, you know, your electrical on the perimeter, everything. And what that does, it puts a monolithic material that wind does not penetrate. And it helps cut down on infiltration or that that is pushed through the building. There's, uh, thanks to Pond, Tyvek, thanks to Pond. Uh, it's a product that they put out here. You, they call them the building wrap. Some people, it's a new product and they wrap the entire building the same way they do on the interior. I prefer the interior. And the reason for that is based on experience with the Los Alamos testing and stuff that they look at several things. The, the pluses to this is it allows this element to be with nature. Most of your moistures and pollutants, odors, uh, cooking, Everything like that comes from your interior, not from your exterior, and can bombard this cavity. If you leave it natural on the exterior, then it's it's available to breathe and work with nature and the swings of the temperatures. If you seal this at this point, then the swings this will have this this will try and be more constant with this, and these odors, moistures and items will end up in your wall over a long period of time if it's sealed at this point because it can't get out. <coughs> I just said, there's all type of research, I guarantee you, since they sell it, Tyvek and them can give you all types of information of why it ought to be here instead of here. But my personal preference is on the interior. I remember us looking at that on those buildings years ago and, and I don't remember all the particulars. And There were some people that come up and they're no longer in the market that they had this same material wrap, but it was a reflective 
uh, you've seen the space blanket for emergency that you wrap yourself in. Well, it's, it's very similar, like crinkly, almost like aluminum foil, but it was a mylar. And you wrap your building in that. And they were quoting numbers like, that will give you an R5. You know, remember that? And then you can put it in the attic and have it sag between the, the joists, and it could be an R10 or some phenomenal numbers. And, and what it is, it, it's reflective and reflects back heat in that cavity. Well, the only problem is you've got to have the cavity. You can't use it with frame construction. You can't use it with stucco. You can't use it with a lot of constructions. If you've got brick out here with a one inch airspace, then full face material will work for you. Full face material does add and contribute because there's a cavity there that the foil does through space age research when that radiation and different things go through the wall that surface does reflect a certain amount back out to the air, like mirrors, basically, in generic terms or layman's terms. So it does, but you have to have an airspace for that to work. You can't have it crammed against each other. But infiltration, and I'll, that's coming up in just a second on it. Well, I'll go ahead and do it now. Turn to page 83 a second. And I, I touched on the fact that it's just a little crack around the door. There's up in the top right corner of 83, there's a box right there. Well, I'll read that to you, but it's on a little crack. A pair of exterior doors with no weather stripping can easily have an opening of a quarter inch where they meet. While this doesn't look or sound like much, on a 6 8 high pair of doors, it adds up to the equivalent of a 20 inch square opening the size of this box similar to a gap on just the average size double windows where the sash and meet would add up to the same 20 inches. So take that square box right there and cut a hole in your wall of your building. That's equivalent to the little crack around those doors. And, and all of us think, well, just I'm in my house, just a little crack. But how many of us would want a hole in your wall the size of that box right there? I mean, that, I mean it didn't take me long for it. Man, that ain't going to work. I mean, that's bad. Well, that's what you've got. But you don't think of it in those terms. So, look at the infiltration of a hole, what that can do to you that size, the impact it would have. Some of the contractors that we uh, perform inspections for, that they're rough openings, they're much too big for the windows. And sometimes they'll have a half inch gap mm -hmm. all the way around, but they don't even address that, like putting insulation in, stuffing insulation in. Right. And they just go ahead and put their materials over that now. Somebody's going to pay dearly for that moment that house needs. Right. Well, that's typical in all commercial details. I mean, I can, I mean, I know every detail because I've had to draw them for so many years to detail out a building, how to build it. And it's, it's a real quandary is how you solve if you've got, this is in plan section, and this is your brick veneer out here. This being the exterior. And we've got the metal studs we've talked about. Okay, so that's a lot better. Okay, and we've got the nice quality of insulation. But now we want to turn in and stop this wall at this point. We've got a drywall here with glass. This is where it stops. We've got glass. Well, typically, they'll come in and put a shim here. And they'll come in and put your storefront, your aluminum member, with your window out here. And you return your drywall right into that. Just turns and wraps in. Well, look at this gap. All they do here is it's called rod and sealant, caulking. There's a little caulk right there. Well, look at that right there. Terrible. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. I mean, uh, that's just one example of a multitude of places for infiltration just to bombard the building. And they're everywhere. They're, it's just a standard in the industry of detailing. And I worked on one building to my extreme frustration for the University of Tulsa. I finally got me used. I got the architect of record and the engineer, because that's I was an apprentice, to use six inch metal studs instead of three and five eighths. Got me used Visqueen, you know, for infiltration. Got me used some other elements, got me used some better quality of glass, and really pushed on it. And uh, I worked and worked and worked the detail. How can you detail? And, and, and the more complex. If you're outside, that's easy because it's flat, but when you get into situations like this and you start detailing, 
you know, angles and the more angular and the more complex the design is, the worse it is to try and solve those problems. And finally, you just say, I've done all I can do, to heck with it, you know, because you just, you can't solve them. It's just, to try and physically figure out how to frame it and make it happen, it's just, a, it's a nightmare. So you've got those throughout your entire, your buildings everywhere that it are, are a serious problem. Another area that, to deal with um, on infiltration, I might say this, your reduction, this one on back on page 80, reduction infiltration um, during construction of new materials and labor can easily reduce the infiltration rate 30 to 50 percent or, or cut your energy uh, heating and cooling by 5 percent. And those are ballpark conservative numbers uh, on commercial buildings. On residential, it's substantially higher. Uh, I want to say a couple other things on that too. On page 79, you know, you're talking. I talk about the air changes per hour. Well, and this is how air infiltration in a new typical building. Your infiltration rates will be in a range of three quarter air changes to 2.5 per hour. Now, the city of Enid administration building. I don't even want to guess what their air changes per hour were, with the way that thing was poorly put together. Uh, but the the more loose the structure is built, the more impact it's going to have on the energy consumption. Uh, ASHRAE standards used to be 0 0.75, wasn't it, for air changes on infiltration rates? Like 0 0.75 or something like that. Well, you're talking about the design standards right. for the buildings themselves, yes. Right. Like, uh, like the book says, 0.3 is an extremely low number. One air change an hour is really quite a low number for residential type construction. And in commercial, construction, the bigger the building, and the volumetrics change such that the number gets smaller, because, but there's a lot of areas for leakage. We try to pressurize buildings in, in commercial work to, to counter ventilation right. infiltration. Well, the one thing I was going to point on that is the house that we designed, we were, our goal was to shoot for 0.5 instead of 0.75 was a standard and we've been told in instances where some people had achieved 0.3 in terms of infiltration rate design but what they experienced from that for example in a house you don't ever want if you best clean the walls you never best clean the ceiling over a period of years you will put your finger through the drywall you just literally push through because moisture has to have a way to get out your late moisture and built up moisture from cooking showers bathing has to and that's why I prefer the viscal on the inside. All that, you know, has ways to get out without getting in your walls and everything cause dry rot problems and situations. But they said that when they got that tight, the houses got that tight, people complained on odors, people complained on oh pollutants. I mean you've got formaldehydes and you got poisons, gases and glues and all your products. And so they complain about, you know, health issues. So that's the other thing. The tighter the building gets, the more it becomes a health consideration because of all the airborne toxins you have to deal with that are in all your glues and carpets and paints and products that are manufactured. So there's a balance there, and that's where the engineers, you know, come into play is using good judgment and industry standards. That's why ASHRAE has industry, industry standards to help protect that. But, um, without... I'm just going to briefly touch through some of these uh, on the envelope starting on page 82. Uh, it's amazing on the low cost, no cost, what you can do obviously on the crack with just new weather strip. The weather strip is in very high. It doesn't cost that much. And if something has to be changed on a regular basis, as high as every year, as long as every five years, it wears out. And the more use it gets, the faster it needs to be changed. You know, a house doesn't get near the work that a city hall gets worked out. Uh, same is true with caulking. You should re caulk and work on your buildings on, on an annual basis. They need to be caulked and, and gone over. Uh, the same is true with the way the doors fit, the way they're adjusted, the way they're closed. Uh, these closures have adjustments on them. They don't always pull the door closed. You know, you get that rattling over a period of time and when the wind hits it it rattles and then, then it gap close gap close gap close your weather stripping so there's all types of things that needs to be done in terms of fixing and adjustment how to do your closures those are low cost no cost that's just to me common sense items uh, there's areas that you can add insulation uh, around in up in the plenums 
not in the plenum itself, but there's areas, there's cavities that can be uh, addressed that uh, we can show you later on that will have an impact and it doesn't cost that much. Uh, for example, well, it's not the envelope, I don't get into that. If you have any dock doors, dock seals, you know, you know, open overhead doors, and you have people backing up and delivering products, there's all kinds of dock shelters, dock seals that can seal off that big opening so it just doesn't have to stay open. And believe it or not, and I've yet to see people think that there are, but there are weather stripping and what they call a, a wind curtain for overhead and roll up doors. But for some reason, most of your cheap doors just have metal to, and a metal track and it just rattles in the wind and the wind just whips around the track and right into the building. Take your garage door in your house. Well, would you believe there's weather strippings on the jams? So when that door comes down, it can literally seal off. You don't see it, but it's there. It's just that not that many people use it. Not that, it's not that common. It doesn't cost that much. In fact, I called on the houses we just completed, and it's uh, eight dollars a door to have it come out, seal it, weather strip it. It's not very high. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the back of the appendix, there's some things there from uh, Builder Square in Tulsa. It's a big, big shopping thing on builders' products, and you can see how cheap glaze and caulking is, and insulation is. I mean, it's it's pretty cheap. To, to take care of it, that's to me I, under maintenance uh, on a seasonal, monthly, and almost daily basis. You have to look at certain issues as to the quality and the age and condition of your structure. Because uh, every spring and fall, caulking can only expand and contract so far. And in Oklahoma, the impact of the soils and how much rain we have and the temperature levels we hit in the summer can crack caulking. I mean, you can literally crack caulkings every season. Depends on the condition that's been placed under. Even some of the best caulking, uh, typically, the only your expensive facilities use real high quality caulk. I've got some that, that we've used on facilities that have been there a long time. And you can buy good quality caulking, but you don't buy it at the lumber yard. They don't carry it. You don't buy it at your builder square. I mean, those are good caulkings for the general rule of thumb, but your high quality caulks are from suppliers, from wholesale suppliers directly to contractors. And usually, if you want to find a good caulk, go to a glazing contractor. Glazing contractors, they've got caulking that are structural, and it will literally hold glass in place six stories high and take What do you call that grease stuff? They used, they used it for years. Well, it could be... It, it was the best in the West, and then they finally discontinued it because EPA or something. Well, it could be butyl. It could be urethane. It could be uh, modified bitumen. It, there's a lot of products that it Vulcan, could be. Vulcan or something like that? Well, Vulcan still may, but that's a trade name. Vulcan. That's a manufacturer, Vulcan. Well, Vulcan uh, I would say 116. As good a caulking as there is in the market. Well, Vul I agree with you there. Vulcan, these a lot on bridge, yes, a lot on bridge structures. If you want another expansion, look on bridge structures to expand those expansion joints where the bridges move. You have to have a lot of, a lot of movement, well, they'll take a lot of elasticity, but you're not going to pay a buck and a half for a tube of it. Really, how can somebody say if uh, a good uh, caulking is expensive? Because if you put it down this year, then it'll last three or four seasons. Where there's cheap stuff, you can put it, you can literally put it down two or three times a year. That's right. So that becomes quite expensive, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And you'll see that in other products. And that's where we get into the life cycle. We're just looking at the cost. The first time cost is not where it's at. Because it takes a man, and the municipalities are the world's guiltiest about you discount labor because you don't really look at it as a, as a business. If you run a business, then you count that man's labor hours it costs to go around and do this. Okay. On a municipality, well, hell, he's on a salary anyway. He might as well be doing that. He can either cut in the hedges or trimming grass or he can be caulking. I, I, I think that's why a lot of cities have got problems right that's now. That's right. Them, them type of hatches. But that's why they're always putting out fires. Yeah. You know, if, if you use yeah. high quality products that last three times the length, on the cycle and the cost of it, and he's freed up to take care of other problems. I mean, you start putting a pencil to it, you know, of caulking once every three to five years versus every season. It doesn't take long to figure up, you know, and if you've got a lot of buildings, it takes a lot of, you just don't run up there and smear it on and walk away. You have to, if to do it right, you have to dig out the old caulking, prepare the surface, and then reglaze it, and it takes a lot of time. And another thing when I go to hospitals, excuse me, on okay. your exterior doors and your hollow metals, 
they were all slugged. After they put up, and uh, before the top beats in, we put a, uh, it was a real slurry, real loose stuff. We poured it. So then we could take a knife, because if it's hollow, the cold would come through. Yeah, and that's, and, and that's not done work. very much. Uh, the contractor I worked for, we required them, and they required that they come around for their final inspection. I mean, it was quite these tied guys that had the little pocket knife. They go, can you give me a bit of something to hollow? You know, that's right. I did. That's right. Well, that's that's just the other point that I'll. That's the other one condition just like that that you just brought up. It's not exactly what you're saying, but concrete block. We have the block, and here's your voids. Overlook the quality of the block there, and then you have what's called a hollow metal frame. Some of them wrap, right. you know. Some of them come clear out here and wrap, but most of them, the blocks like this, and they'll set right here. That's the ones that bone right there. Okay, and what they'll do is they'll set a, a block in here to shoot it to, and it's totally open. I mean, it's hollow. I mean, it's just the gauge of the metals. All you've got to protect you through there. You know, and then you got your door. I don't care how good your door is. You know, you're wide open around those hollow metals. They're hollow. That's why they're called hollow metal frames. The people think, well, it's hollow metal frame, but it, hollow, hollow. You know, that's what it is. It's a hollow metal frame. But you know, we just get so used to not thinking in those terms, and we just, you know. And the same. Now they have doors now that are foam filled that you can get R10 on those doors. Where typically the doors usually four or less, you know, wood doors and different types. So there's there's all types of products that you can do, and you can change a door out. That's not that hard. You can they can drill a door they can drill that cavity and plug, you know after the fact and plug it. Yeah. I mean there's all types of things you can do uh, that can impact. It's low cost, no cost. Uh, Charlie, on this. Do you want to hit lighting in the morning or you want to go and start lighting? Well, we're talking about lighting in the morning. Okay. And, uh, we're to the, uh, the right? Sounds good to me. <coughs> I'm going to suggest that we all take a five minute break. Five minute break? I guess I'm not that bad. Stand up and stretch break. Let's wrap up the day with uh, going back just a little bit and talking about uh, HVAC systems. It's next on the schedule, but we covered some of these things this morning also. Uh, HVAC systems, heating, ventilation, air conditioning. I've categorized just real general terms here what we have, but you can have various heating systems with electric strip heat, heat pumps, gas furnaces, hot water boilers, steam boilers, waste heat recovery. And then a little bit later I'll show you some calculations to show how these compare to one another. Uh, you'll probably find in your facilities uh, some of all of this except perhaps waste heat recovery. In, uh, in our travels through the three cities, we found uh, all of that except waste heat recovery. Most frequently, probably, was gas fired furnaces, and that might be associated with rooftop units or split systems. Uh, ventilation systems, we're referring to exhaust systems, whether that be meeting rooms or exhaust for relief air or toilet facilities. Typically, you're going to find the building is exhausted at the rate of 0.1 to 0.2 CFM per square foot. And that air that's exhausted needs to be made up through the mechanical system so that the air comes in through a filter rather than through a crack around the door. Uh, a good design system would, would have a makeup air system uh, connected to outside air with a filtering setup so that you would be making the air up through the mechanical equipment. Uh, there is also another aspect of ventilation which provides fresh air cooling. That works pretty well in the ranges of uh, 55 to 60 degrees and sometimes you can push it to the limit at 65 degrees. Uh, you really can't achieve a whole lot of cooling with 65 degree air. 
most systems are designed to function with uh, 60 and below. Uh, but when you do that, when you bring in the fresh air for cooling in a ventilation cycle, you do create a couple of problems. You have to remove the air. You just can't blow the building up with all of this air and not provide it a path to escape. So you've got to have a design that works with that. Uh, you can have, in a modulating uh, fresh air cooling system, up to one and a half CFM per square foot. That's a lot of air. So you need to take takes large areas to uh, exhaust that air, and so this does cause problems in design, particularly when you're going back in retrofitting design to do a fresh air cooling uh, scheme. Air conditioning, when we're talking about air conditioning, we're normally talking about mechanical cooled air, mechanically cooled air. And those are categorized primarily as DX, direct expansion systems, uh, chilled water systems, we're, we're treating the uh, air with either refrigerant in a coil or chilled water in a coil. Most cases in Oklahoma, if you have chilled water, you're developing that <coughs> with an electric uh, system of some sort. Usually it would be in a large building, a centrifugal system. In a few cases, which uh, I'm aware of, probably 20, 25 years ago, uh, natural gas absorption was used fairly commonly on a high quality building. Uh, if you have one of those or if you find a gas absorber today and it's 25 years old, you need to run up a red flag because that's probably the worst energy hog that exists anywhere in the market today. An old uh, single stage uh, gas fired absorber. The systems that you can have in air delivery, all of these systems we're talking about for heating, ventilation, air conditioning require air delivery. Um, we haven't really talked about the non-air delivery systems for heating and there are some of those, but they're not very common in, in this part of the country. But we have constant volume airflow which delivers the same rate of air all the time. That would be what you'd find with a rooftop package. You, buy a rooftop unit, set it up there, connect the ductwork and then turn it on and after it's set up the design is that the airflow constantly moves the same amount of air all the time that it's on. Uh, in order to control temperature either the compressor turns on and off or the gas furnace turns on and off varying the temperature of the air uh, but maintaining constant airflow. The other system that is not real common but has probably the last 15 years has been used in the bigger, more quality projects is a variable volume airflow system. We talked about that a little bit earlier. That just provides a means by which you can hold the air temperature constant and vary the air volume. There, uh, additionally, the uh, systems are enhanced with terminal reheat for zone treatment and of course the heating can be electric or gas depending on what type of system. There is a, I would bet in every one of your cities if you have a major uh, major building that's 20 years old it's very likely a multi-zone system with either direct expansion cooling or chilled water cooling. That was very popular uh, 20 some years ago. It's probably the best system for temperature and comfort that ever was designed but it's an energy hog, and there are ways to treat that. Uh, dual duct is another means of multi-zone. In a dual duct design, a hot, a hot air duct and a cold air duct were run throughout the building, and at every particular zone, you'd supply it with a hot air duct and a cold air duct, and the thermostat on the wall would decide, well, I want cold air now, and now I want hot air, and it would switch back and forth you had to simultaneously run a heating system and a cooling system to satisfy the needs of a dual duct system and a multi-zone system. They're nearly the same functionally. Their mechanics are different, but they both are energy hogs. Um, I guess we've been talking about Enid. You might guess that Enid has a multi-zone system with no economizer cycle. 
Uh, of course, then we've talked about there are free air cooling systems and free cooling systems using water. Uh, these air conditioning systems are uh, uh, made up of various components. A, a free cooling system that would involve water would only be really usable for you if you had a water cooling tower or a chilled water system that you could add a cooling tower to, but certain times of the year you can create chilled water in a cooling tower without having to run a compressor system by circuiting that water through heat exchanger to keep the two water streams separated you can cool the building without running expensive compressors um, which system is the most energy efficient in the variable the most energy efficient on heating is probably some form of gas hot water and the most energy efficient on cooling from an air delivery standpoint would be the variable volume. Um, combinations of the two, the most energy efficient way to create chilled water is with a gas fired absorber. And I'll show you some figures on that in just a moment. Now there's, when we talk about saving energy, we're not necessarily talking about what it costs to buy it in the first place and those economic decisions have to be studied but for a good, good quality, environmentally sound design, when I'm saying environmentally, I'm talking about comfort in the space, it, the system can respond and adjust itself, match load to load. Variable volume with some form of perimeter reheat is probably the best system that blends energy conservation with good design. Um, Waste heat recovery has uh, has been available from a lot of different areas. The train company built a waste heat recovery chiller uh, 25 years ago, and it hasn't been used a lot, but it provides a way for you to generate hot water uh, at the same time you're generating cold water, so you can take that waste heat that would have gone outdoors, put it back through the hot water system or the reheat, preheat loop. Um, you don't see that much. I really doubt if you'll even see it all in your buildings. Um, can er everybody see this pretty well? This I'm, I'm going to show you an example in a minute of a 3,500 square foot building, and that's approximately 60 by 60. Uh, it's 100 feet off, but basically in an office building, you can have an arrangement like this. This would require a 10 ton air conditioning unit typically but you can see the problem if if north were up west east one air conditioning unit let's put the thermostat in the boss's office right here you have one thermostat it's not a variable volume system it's constant volume and the, let's put the unit somewhere outside and just run the duct work in. This, this fellow is going to maintain his temperature at 75 degrees. And this person down here on the opposite side of the building will get whatever air is required to keep this man comfortable. This room will probably be the only room in the whole building that's reasonably comfortable. The rest will be at some point away from comfort. Uh, summertime, these areas along the east, <clears throat> say afternoon when it's hot over on the west side, the east side will get the amount of cooling required that it takes to keep the west side cool. Conversely, in the morning, this area will probably warm up because the sun's on the east and this is, this is the uh, cool side of the building. I, I'm probably not telling you all anything you don't know, but I wanted to show you what you can do with that same system if you if you take this this ductwork and split it get my pen to work here and this has to be done in design but you can put a control box and now you can give control to the air 
so that each side of the building can receive the amount of cool air or warm air that's needed for the particular instance. And that's a simple example, but instead of having one side hot and one side cold, it allows the air to be controlled to the point that the exact cooling requirement for this office can be met at the same time that this one's met. Now, as you can see, we have three other spaces on each zone that are only going to be as good as this zone here. Now, by selecting the zones in the proper way, you can group areas together so if they have similar usage, they will respond similarly. You can take it one step further and in uh, you know, hospitals and <coughs> nice offices, every, every office has a thermostat and every thermostat has a control box and every room has the exact temperature they want, hot or cold. Um, that's done through the damper, right? Yes, sir. It's done through a damper in the supply grill. A thermostat like this right here would vary the air to this room. If the room got too hot, it would open the air up. As the room cooled off, it would pinch down. As it continued to sound a winter day, it would get a little colder, a little colder. It would open a little hot water valve and, and let in enough heat to warm it back up. There is a, another design instead of using a, a hot water coil would turn on a little fan that would pull air out of the plenum and then we circulate more warm plenum air and then somewhere in the plenum you have to provide heat to, to the plenum. But an expansion on variable volume system is the way most buildings are going today. Some form of a variable volume control with terminal reheat or plenum heat recovery. They, uh, there are some pros and cons on the plenum systems because of the uh, maintenance requirement that you have to get involved with with uh, a plenum fan and having filters up in the plenum and having to get up there. Um, Well, I just this I only am showing you this just to kind of set you up for the next I appreciate slide. That. I get scared. Um, energy usage in a building. Let, let me ask you to look at the first page of your appendix. It's an editorial, and I don't have mine with me, but. That's an article from Heating, Refrigeration, Air Conditioning News. And uh, on the right-hand column under the word buildings, it says America's buildings now account for two-thirds of our electrical consumption. Now that's, that's a pretty strong statement. What do you want to get at? particular situation you'll find that uh, two-thirds of your electrical sum consumption is in your buildings because you're going to have uh, your total electric bill is heavily weighted towards processing pumping and so on but if you exclude that uh, all of your electric consumption is in the buildings except for street light. 
that's an interesting article just to kind of sets you up for this comment. I wanted to show you how we calculate in a simple equation heating and, and uh, heating and cooling usage. This basic equation that's used before the days of computers, this equation was accepted. Now we basically use a computer to look at every hour of the day of the year. But we have the energy used is a product of the heat transfer load, Q, times 24, that's 24 hours in the day, times the heating degree day, which we talked about earlier this morning, times the CD factor, which is a factor for internal heat gain. Divide that by the delta T of the building you're referring to, the temperature difference between the inside and the outside of the building and design condition, divide that by the efficiency. That gives you a BTU per year number. That is, how many BTUs per year does it take to heat your building? Now you have to convert that into the fuel units of whatever fuel units you're using. If you're using electricity, you convert that to kilowatt hours. If you're buying gas or propane, you have to convert that. <coughs> Cooling in a similar, similarly crude but accepted up until the age of computers, the number of tons times the full load hours times the kilowatt hours per ton is equal to kilowatt hours. And it's kilowatt hours per ton there. Yeah, it's kW per ton. Tons, full load hours times kilowatt hours per ton is equal to kilowatt hours. This area right here is talking about heating now. If we assume we have one million BTUs of heating and you have a choice of how to do it, you can provide that one million BTUs with electric strip heat. That right there is probably a blur, but that's .06 dollars per kilowatt hour or six cents. To do a million BTUs of heating with electricity costs you $17.57 at six cents kilowatt hour. If you do the same heating with a gas furnace at four dollars, which is a higher number than Benita's paying, and you have a 60% efficient furnace, which is a, probably a good number for an old furnace, now that would cost you $6.66. 60% efficiency. Some of your older furnaces are not doing that good. Uh, you can see it progresses on up. If you can buy a new furnace, uh, some of the furnaces advertise 90%, 92% efficiency. Those are condensing type furnaces. You can provide a million BTUs for $4.44. Now we found in Enid, unfortunately, a lot of electric strip heat. We lectured them pretty good about that. We we uh, we think that they're going to be converting. Not all of the buildings were electric strip heat, by the way, but uh, didn't, we haven't seen many heat pumps anywhere in the cities that we've been. But a heat pump, a uh, I'm, I'm referring to a residential style heat pump in the up to five ton capacity, uh, is a little more complex calculation than than this, but approximately $8.79 to $7.03 depending on the COP. So it falls somewhere above gas but certainly less than electric strip heat in terms of what it would cost you to generate a million BTUs of heating. And depending on your gas and electric rates, as you can see, an inefficient gas furnace and a real good heat pump can get to a point where they could be a wash. We ran these numbers, uh, these numbers right here on uh, Enid, Ada, and Okmulgee, and you'd think they might be similar, but uh, the electric rates and the gas rates are so different in those three cities. 
um, and they'll be different in your area. It, it seemed to, we thought they might be the same, but they're vastly different. What efficiency rate do you get on that electric strip? Is that 100% efficiency? Uh -huh. Well, yeah. Virtually every, every every watt that goes in comes out as a BTU, except for a very small amount that might be lost in the furnace. But it's virtually 100%. Well, G&E put on a lot of control groups on their air conditioning. Did you find any of those on the cities that you were at? We saw them in Ada. Yeah. Um, I don't remember any, anywhere else. I've got one on my house in the first two weeks. I have this alarm just down there. Because all it does is cycle your compression a lot more than where it's compressing it out. And the peak mode in July and August, it'll never satisfy the temperature. Cycles a unit, and so the hotter the temperature is, the more it cycles, the more your density is off. And the hotter you got uh, hubs of Hades in the house, so I'm going down to. I was saving like Christy, I was miserable, and I was wearing my unit out. I mean, it was cycling on and off, on and off, on and off, on and off. What kind of break did they give you? Well, I don't remember. Theoretically, I'm still getting that break, it's still on the side of my unit, both units. I think about $10 a month for the coffee. You're cheating, in other words, right? They turn you in. Well, I, I take no. They haven't called me and asked me. It's just like me calling and asking them. If they call and ask me, I'll just go back and tell them I've disconnected. I'm sure you did until they call and ask me. I'm not telling them anything. Well, they had close to 100,000 of those things out. Huh? I think they had close to 100,000 of those units out. Yeah. Is there any questions on this? I want to go to an example. This typical office building here, if you would permit me to say that it's 10 tons and 200,000 BTUs per hour design load, and those, those are not hard numbers, they're typical numbers. Uh, you'll probably find if you have a building that size, it'll be very close to 10 tons or 12 maybe. Heating degree days, 3680. The CD factor for internal heat gain, which, which reduces the amount of heating energy you calculate, and that's a grab number uh, depending on a lot of things, but for this, let's just leave it at 0.8. Furnace efficiency, 0.7 or 70%. I'm going to use an air conditioning efficiency EER of 8, which translates to 1.5 kW per ton. And I'm going to say that it has a cooling full load hours of 1,500, and that, that could be just as easily 2,000 or 2,500, depending on how you use the building. But for this example, this, this building you have this building heating with electric strip heat, you can see $6,939 per year for heating. If it had a 70% efficiency gas furnace, the cost would be $2,251. An 80% efficiency gas furnace, $1,971. The Manufacturers have been selling 80% efficiency gas furnaces for at least 10 years that I'm aware of. So you'll find, you may find some of those, but the majority of what we saw were the old gas furnaces. Most of the buildings were old. We didn't find very many new uh, equipment. Those are going to be 60, maybe 55% efficiency. And this is natural gas, right? uh, Yes, natural gas. Yeah, this. Well, not. It would, would it be higher? Or, yes, or higher? in terms of dollars, it'd be a lot higher. It would near. It'd be near to the electric strip. Okay. Where's the uh, I don't think. Did we find? We didn't find any propane, did we? In the three cities. Uh, cooling cost. Using that equation on, that we talked about before, we have 10 tons times 1,500 hours 
1.5 kW per ton and six cents per kilowatt hour. The cooling cost for that building is 1350. Now, if you would instead use a 10 EER, you could get to $1,080. And by the way, a, a rooftop unit, I recently had a project where I was trying to get a real high efficiency rooftop unit. An 8.5, 8.6 is good for a rooftop. Uh, Mike was talking about the units being inexpensive. The, the less expensive buildings, cheap buildings, buy rooftop units. You know, or you buy splits that are not very good. Uh, you get into the better efficiency equipment when you're starting to talk about chillers, cooling towers, or gas fired absorbers. I didn't really get into, in a 10 ton capacity, you don't really talk about chillers, but I threw a gas fire absorber in there just to show you what, uh, what the gas cost would have been. $720 for the gas cost to generate the cooling plus the cost of the pumps. And that, that might, I'm just going to take a guess, but that might be $20 a year for pump cost. It's not a whole lot. So that gives you, if you add the best, and I'm not counting the gas fire absorber, but the best gas furnace at 80% and the 10 EER unit, that gives you an 87 cents per square foot cost to operate your building. And you take the worst case, which is electric strip heat, and a 6 EER unit, which this might be, say, one of your old buildings that was built 25 years ago or 20 years ago and you just are lucky enough to have that old unit still working, you're paying $2.49 a square foot to operate your building. Surprisingly, I an awful lot of money. Uh -huh. I really did. We found uh, Enid, you know, Charlie helped me and y'all, <laughs> I was sitting back there, I couldn't find the figures just a while ago, but I believe we had in Enid some of the buildings over $3 a square foot. So, yeah. so you can see what your potentials are if you if you can get the capital together by efficient air conditioning and efficient heating and then do a good maybe a re, little bit of redesign on the ductwork so you get the zoning like you need it you can be comfortable and save a lot of money on operating your buildings you have to you have to look at each building individually I'll give you Another good example at Enid, uh, in their library, they needed to replace the boiler and they needed to replace the air conditioning equipment. And they wanted us to do, to try to show that we could do all that on the backs of energy conservation. We could show great savings, but we couldn't make it pay back in less, you know, it was something like 11, 12 years. So you're going to have to consider that energy conservation in this level of, you know, it takes a lot of money to do that work and it's a good investment for the city. If you, if you can make a 10 year investment in equipment that lasts 30 years, well, you've made a good investment. Well, as Ed tried to point out, they look at it wrong. I mean, the most efficient way in terms of heating and cooling is to not do it. Right? So, what, that's what they were saying. They were saying, well, let's pay for this entire replacement. What we're saying is, no, that's not right. You're going to have a heating unit. You're going to have an air conditioning unit. Let's pay for energy conservation through upgrades of the equipment. Because if you're looking at what's most efficient, it's going to even provide heating or cooling. And we're going to prepare that. I mean, let's keep out with that. So that's what we're saying is, you're going to have a furnace. You're going to have a condensing unit. Let's look at comparisons of better efficiency equipment versus the lower grade equipment. You know, if we could have got a look at that, the delta between like the gas fire absorption versus the centrifugal chillers and a boiler, you know, then, then the paybacks there faster. To give you another little thought about uh, centrifugal chillers and gas fire absorbers, we're using a good split system as a 10 EER, and it shows 1.2 kW per ton. If you if you have a big enough building that you can buy a centrifugal chiller, you can get numbers in the range 
instead of 1.2, it's like 0.7 kW per ton. So like, take that number and cut it in half if you had a centrifugal chiller. But not very many of y'all have big buildings that would, you know, you probably did Durant's in your buildings. Marlsville. Yeah. But B Bixby, population 10,000, we have rooftop units and everywhere you look. They have a lot of rooftop units. Uh -huh. and, and they make, uh, you know, they make sense. You have to look at every application. You do the best you can with what you have at the time. And that's the way that I imagine you all will approach this program, is you're not going to be able to put a gas absorber in every one of your buildings because it's cost prohibitive. And on an individual basis, it might not even make economic sense. But I, I wanted to do this to show the range of available performances that you could get. Well, if I was rearranging the air in one of these existing buildings, how did I figure how many CFM it would take per square foot, say, in a ton, 350 square feet? Yeah, more or less. How do I get how many, how big my duck's going to be to get the right CFM for one of the buildings if I'm rearranging well, it, it gets into the area of, uh, it's, it's not a, uh, it's not something that you can really do by rule of thumb. Normally speaking, you, you would use a ton of air conditioning would require 400 CFM, 400 CFM, so then you could take that number and go to the handbook on uh, duct sizing with airflow and then pick if you're just wanting to just make some rearrangements, there are a, a little handheld device called a duculator, or you could take a calculator and figure the velocity, keep the velocity 500 foot per minute or under 1,000 foot per minute and size it by area. That's a simplified way to do it. But if you're going to do any major renovations at all, I would suggest that you include uh, not only the duct work, but the lighting, taking a look at efficiency and lighting, and then because of the lighting reduces the heat in the space, you might be able to reduce the airflow actually instead of having to increase it. Uh, there, there's a, Charlie will get into that tomorrow, but a uh, combination of effects can, uh, can do some surprising things for you. Insulating the roof to cut off the roof load, using high efficiency lighting to take out the 25% factor that I'll put in there if you don't use the high efficiency lighting. Just talk about those. That's a nice chart there on heating degree days. It says if uh, fuel savings, if the thermostat setting is reduced by five degrees. Where are we at? On page 99. I'm on page 99. take 4,000 heating degree days and a five degree setback at night. And this little chart says you'd save 20 percent on your your heating bill just by lowering the temperature <coughs> five degrees overnight. Uh, that's something that's easy to say. I'm pretty sure from from what we've seen that it doesn't happen very much unless unless you have a real stout energy manager that, that stays on top of it. Um, a city like Bartlesville with 100 buildings and 500 thermostats, that would be hard to manage. But it does work. Setting the thermostats higher during the cooling season uh, saves cooling energy in the same fashion. Uh, locking thermostats if necessary We've been talking quite a bit about uh, energy conservation through these simple means, and one of the things we maybe will get to later 
is the centralized computer networking of controls that uh, one of, we tried and we did talk to Enid about developing a system for their buildings and probably that's if you can get to a point of making the investment that would be the best way to handle your your problem uh, taking as in page 102 a individually programmable thermostat as is depicted by that picture there that works well but I've had experiences with that on a large scale and, a, and it was a very unhappy experience I, I put 20 of these in a building one time and, and uh, I found out within the first six months that the programming and the maintaining of the programming in the thermostats was was quite a problem. Uh, not that the thermostats didn't work okay, but you know, a random failure of one kind or another required the janitor to reprogram 20 thermostats and, and that really proved to be a problem and it, I think it on a one-by-one -one basis, I don't know what your experience is in Seminole, maybe, but do you even have programmable stats anywhere? No. Is there anyone here that uses programmable stats in your buildings? Reducing, reducing or eliminate, eliminating vestibule heating. Uh, that's a way to save energy. It, again, this might not be something you choose to do. You might like to have your vestibules warm. I know it's a comfort condition for a lot of buildings. Uh, could be that you could build a vestibule and just not heat it. Maybe that as an approach, but in. This little picture here is depicting maybe an older building that has a vestibule heating that uh, you'll frequently go into a building that the vestibule might be 85 degrees. Well, you could control that better maybe and, and such or, or, or eliminate it. Just an example. Uh, have someone test and adjust your central heating system and clean it. This is talking about air balancing. We talked a little bit about air balancing today. Um, this building right here would be a perfect example if this were, say, 10 years old. Uh, additions have been made, things have been added. The, the fan curve, the, the fan is off of its fan curve. You're getting a lot of air in this space, not enough air down here. This fellow might have taped over his diffuser and he likes it warm. And all kinds of things happen that can disrupt the, the system and it, it really would pay to go through and, and uh, spend some time cleaning the ductwork and adjusting the grills and maybe looking at where grills have been totally closed off, things like that, just to get the airflow moving through the space. It said, another one says to use exhaust fans as little as possible. The reason they're talking about that is because of the fact that uh, when you pull out a volume of air, it has to be made up, and that takes energy to, to warm it or, or cool it. Uh, optimally, you would want to exhaust as little as possible to the limit, and the limit being odors and uh, smoke removal and things like that. Replacing air filters regularly, uh, that, that's well understood, I think, but it might not be 
practice, but uh, twice a year is recommended. Sometimes your units will have pressure gauges on them that you, you can observe when the time to change the filter is. And um, by changing the filter and keeping high rates of airflow moving through your building, you'll have better comfort and cleaner air. Check and repair faulty steam traps. I'll, I'll be curious, how many here have uh, steam systems? Marlsville. You have, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, boy. Um, there's a lot of work that can be done with uh, steam traps, uh, insulation, keeping them insulated, making sure they're not leaking. <coughs> Closed duct joints and repair insulation. There's a couple pages here on heat pumps, which I would just let you all read that. And then page 108 has a little checklist for you. Uh, when we get into our uh, audit forms, we have some checklists in there that give you quite a uh, quite lengthy uh, list of things to check that would be real good for your maintenance people to go through and make sure that they've answered all the questions and it gives them tips on things to look for that they might not have thought about. Um, in, uh, in looking at your equipment, this page 109 here gives you a place to uh, list any thoughts you have or any areas you want to improve on to, to make a list and get a cost estimate. When, when you're looking at, let's say you might want to change to a, to a better piece of air conditioning equipment, you want to know and calculate what the savings would be. In this case here, if you had an 8 and you wanted to change to a to a 10, you can see that it would 1350 minus 1080, you know, that's whatever that is, that's $275.80. That might cost you might cost you $500 to change, so that, that might be a two-year payback. Uh, you know, it might just as well, depending on your situation, it might involve some other things. You might have to change the evaporator coil or run a new set of lines or something, and it might cost a thousand dollars. So there's, you know, there's a a longer payback. So the specific costs have to be looked at. We will try to help you with that when we get to that point. Um, are there any questions on anything in this space? Not, let's turn it back to Mike. Well, everything we've talked on today, uh, we'll get some more on tomorrow and other subjects. But strongly recommend that even as trite as some of the sayings are, as or as abstract as some of that is, do read it. Uh, it'll open up a lot of thought process to you. On the even the HV section, Ed briefly touched on as well. There's a little ideas in there that you can do that we'll be addressing some of those later in the design phase as options to you uh, for consideration. They do make a lot of sense that there are low cost, no cost, and there's some things we'll discuss later just administrative decisions uh, that you don't change anything except the way you operate. You know, just you know, we've talked a little bit about that and just the way you're used to operating facilities uh, that you can impact a lot of energy cost. I'm going to check right quick with Anita. Some of you, I think, go ahead, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just want to ask Anita if we can have a copy of that registration form for everybody's name, city, and address. Okay. I'll go have her make one right now. I understand uh, some of you are heading back this evening. I forgot which group, seven of them. But then the rest of you, I'm assuming, stand for the reception or not. And that's uh, mm -hmm. city of Coweta. So we're losing two cities, but okay. We're, we're having a few other state for reception, correct? Okay, I'll go find out if that's set up, because I'm sure it is. And I'll have her run those copies real quick. Okay. 